Now, if I were to ask you what gerrymandering is, does that ring any bells uh, at all? Gerrymandering. Gerrymandering. Sounds like a person. <laughs> but like, is it an action? Like, I'm thinking like Jerry Smith from Rick and Morty. Um, <laughs> that was my, the first Jerry that came to my mind. Okay. Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does ring a bell. I can't remember what it is. So essentially everyone does it and it's not unique to either party. But Bjorki Peterson took it to an extreme that we've probably never really seen in Australia before or since. It's when you reorder electorates so that basically it favours you at the elections. Mm. So you kind of redesign the electorates so that you can either stack an electorate with people who you think are going to vote for you or so that you kind of cram heaps of people that you know won't vote for you into the one electorate and water down their power. And so... That gerrymandering has been around since the beginning of kind of organized democracy. Labor did it first in Queensland. And in 1949, Joe Bjorki Peterson went on record saying, Labor's basically saying, whether you like it or not, we will be the government. So he's clearly expressed, oh, punch my. He's clearly expressed moral outrage at the idea of gerrymandering. When he comes to power, it kind of reaches an extreme never seen before. Now, in 1969, that's the first election he was facing. Gerrymandering wasn't so bad. It was pretty stock standard gerrymandering for the time, but it was still pretty substantial. So if you're Bjorki Peterson, how are you going to reorder the electorates? What are you going to do? Well, it would, it'd be much the same as what you just explained, right? You stack the, the Labor voters in one go so they can just control a handful of seats, but not a significant amount. So where would you divide? Where would you try and separate into whole new seats and give new seats to? Do you want, do you want to put like sort of really control Brisbane's power. We don't, there is sort of this anti-Brisbane kind of yep. kind of vibe we got from earlier. Give them as little electorates as possible and yep. have them as overcrowded yep. as possible. Yep. And then where would you see, kind I of see. S- split all the different electorates? Where would you try and break them down into even smaller geographically? Rather Maybe than just like a, like a per peanut farm electorate. Kind <laughs> of thing. Yeah. That's probably how I'd do it. Townsville. <laughs> <laughs> no, Townsville is actually Labor Territory. So, yeah, basically give the farms as much voting power as possible. And so what actually ended up happening was basically urban electorates would have three times the amount of people in them as as rural electorates, which meant they were watered down to have one third of the voting power. So I thought, didn't electorates have to have a very similar amount of people? They're supposed to. Yeah. And that's the general guiding principle. But there is no hard and fast rule as to how many people constitute an electorate. Because the theory behind it is the same thing as the American Electoral College the theory behind it is like, is, this is kind of quite a Republican talking point. People often ask, because the Democrats have his, recently have been winning the primary vote in, in all the recent elections. Yeah, we have 2016 where Hillary Clinton got more votes than Trump, but Trump won the election because he won the Electoral College. Mm-hmm. And so the question is, why, why isn't it just a popular vote? Mm-hmm. And the argument that Republicans put forward is that 51% of the population don't control the other 49% that are very culturally different. So it's not going to be an entirely even democracy and we want to have it so that everyone gets a voice and that your voice isn't watered down just because you're a different cultural group. So say you're a rural person rather than an urban person. And so that's kind of the theory behind it. So basically the the rural seats become much more thinly concentrated and the urban seats are kind of stacked with lots of people to water down the vote. Here's just some stats in the 1969 election. So Labor won 44% of all votes. So they got 44% on the popular vote. Mm. Only got 39% of the seats. Wow. Liberal Party got 23% of the popular vote and picked up 24% of the seats. Mm-hmm. The Country Party picked up 23% of the votes on a popular vote and won 33% of seats. Yeah, wow. Seems undemocratic. <laughs> so and that's and again, this this is this is the other talking point that Republicans bring Democrat. up in America. Republicans will often say we're a republic, not a democracy. And so we don't pursue democracy in its purest form. We actually have a republic where everyone gets a say regardless. And we empower voices that might be weaker and and a minority in a country. It's actually quite a woke talking point if you think about it. Mm, Yeah. But it's coming from... Very un-Republican. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like technically really Republican with a small LR, but very un-Republican with a capital R. You kind of follow... (laughs) And so 1972, it gets even more extreme. So Labor's popular vote goes up between 69 and 72. So Labor's popular vote in 1972 is 47%. They pick up 40% of the seats. The country party picks up 20% of the votes. They lose actually popular votes, but they go up 31% of the seats. 
And so wow. it's this completely inequitable <laughs> system where urban votes are completely outranked. Mm. And so basically... How's that allowed? Well, who's going to... They're yeah, the government. Like, there's no rule, so... Yeah. It just... Seems like there should be a rule. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, well, again, like, because of population change, like, mm. I don't know, let's just take the Shire, for example, we're recording this. Our population's exploded in the last five years, mainly because we've got a mayor that kind of allows pretty <laughs> dodgy <Yeah. laughs> zoning laws. <laughs> that, <laughs> hey, that's a topic for another day. And <laughs> so, theoretically, right, we should probably have reordering for the next election where Hughes and Cook get to, and you add Banks going into St. George where those three electorates get divided up a little bit to try and make it a little bit more even. Mm. So we do need to have electoral redivision, but yeah, exactly. Like you can then just run with it and completely yeah. tailor it to your own needs. And every every party does this. This isn't a national party specific issue. It was just Bjorki Peterson did it in a much more extreme manner than anyone has done before in Australia. And so 72, he does, what he does is in between 69 and 72, there were three electoral divisions. There was... Urban, so Brisbane, regional, like Mackay, and then rural, which was King Roy. You add what Bjorki Peterson does is he adds a fourth category and he calls them remote. Because there's a difference between rural and remote. So let's just use New South Wales towns, for example. Mm. Let's let's have a crack. Let's have a go. So mm. I reckon So rural, obviously, let's let's By just say of us Sydney. knowing them feels like it would have Rural been Sydney. No, did I say that? I, I meant uh, uh, urban. Urban, sorry. Sydney. Um, Newcastle. No, Newcastle's still a, yeah. Yeah, Newcastle's still, still urban. urban, yeah. You could say urban. Rural. Um, so, you know, regional, somewhere like Port Macquarie. Regional. Port Mac. Yep, yep. So, then rural would be, like, are we talking mm. like Cobar? Do you, reckon, do you reckon like orange is orange. rural or is that still regional? That's probably moving more to the rural category. Yeah. But so, probably still too big. Um so I think like 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 Bathurst, Bathurst yeah. and Orange, yeah, probably are in between those two categories. And again, apologies for all our non-New South Wales. I believe viewers. we just a- completely hijacked it to talk about our point of reference. I believe there's a small town in New South Wales called Tottenham. Um, yes, yeah. like a, I think that might even be remote, but definitely rural. Yeah, yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm not sure about Tottenham, but yeah, there's well, I, the one I was thinking was Aberdeen. If, if it's got a name of like an English or a Scottish yeah. town that <laughs> hasn't made it into the mainstream. New South Wales mm. kind of vernacular, then they're probably rural. Uh, remote would be a place like Lightning Ridge. Yeah. 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 So. Armadale. That'd be. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's on the rural that's regional. Almost, yeah, 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 almost. Yeah, yeah. That's probably regional. Right? It's got a GPS school. Like, how can yeah. you sure, sure. True. Only one outside of Sydney in New South Wales. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit of trivia for you. Mm. So, Hill. So what Bioki Peterson does is he's like, we need to empower the remote voice because the remote voice is getting screwed over. They weren't, but that was Bjorki Peterson's argument. So we need to make sure that we, when we reorder our electorates, we are empowering the remote vote. And obviously a remote person is going to vote for Peterson because they're farmers who want to have as much land clearing as possible so they can build their farms to be as big as possible. And so from in 72, that's when it gets completely ridiculous. The issue with the Bjorki Mander as well as it became known was it actually, it hurt someone more than Labor. It hurt the Libs more than Labor. Because where do the Liberals get their seats? Urban areas. That's that's prime time Liberal territory. The Burbs. Like that's mm. supposed to be the land of the Libs. And Bjorki Peterson completely removes their vote by watering down the concentration of urban votes. And so he, in his first five years or so, he actually concentrates power just through reordering the electorates. And this pretty much secures his long term viability. Because it doesn't matter how unpopular Bjorki Peterson gets. And again, he won the election in 72 with 20% of the popular vote voting for his party. Yeah, that's that, wild. That and, is insane. And so he'd just be like, that, you, I'm, I'm the boss and there is nothing that anyone can do about it. Yeah. Mm. Like you said, my ball, my rules. Like, mm. um, so, and then they're obviously only in power, right? Because of the, having the coalition. Yeah. In that. They're, yeah, neither, they still, they still need a party. Votes. Like the Labor Party still beats both of them, but because of the coalition, they yeah, yep, exactly right. So he does, he does some other things that help him concentrate power. So 1972, the Springboks come out to play a game of rugby, an exhibition series in Australia, mm-hmm. and the 70s is obviously as we discussed with the Gaddafi episode, 
the kind of globe's perception of South Africa is really controversial issue because mm. the globe's yeah. pretty yeah. heavily now anti-apartheid because the sixties we've gone through the civil rights movement in the USA. We've had our own civil rights movement in the sixties with indigenous rights. And so there's a lot of backlash now against the apartheid regime in South Africa. So there was lots of protesting when the Springboks were coming out to Australia. So lots of protesting in Melbourne and Sydney. And so what Bjorki Peterson does is he declares a state of emergency <laughs> oh. to deal with potential protesters that are non-existent so far. So it's a preemptive state of emergency so that the Springboks can come and play. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't Suncorp Stadium because it was too big. Lang Park. Well, it was played... It could be. It was, Lang Park actually does sound right. Mm. It was played behind closed doors. And so they uh-huh. had 7,000, like literally barbed wire was put up <laughs> and 7,000 people could come and watch. And so the point is with state of the emergency, police basically had unfettered power to suppress protesters, however they may have looked. And What was um? What did Bjorki Peterson even want with the, the spring box? Is it just, just loved his rugby? Yeah. Like, is there a reason he... No, the, probably the, the, well, the, the more likely reason was that he wanted to then actually assert himself with power and actually do something to create an image for himself as the leader of, of Queensland. So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of half imagery, so half like I'm acting decisively. Mm. And again, like a lot of people are in a state of panic and they're like, this is a strong guy who is standing up and yeah. is making sure that we can actually go to the rugby safely. Mm. Probably it would have been more effective if he did it for league because it's Queensland. Yeah. yeah. Rugby union. It's not a very, you know, it's not the common man game, right? It's no, not no, the no. farmer's <laughs> game. <laughs> but it might, it was much more Maybe back then. Maybe different yeah, sure, at that okay. time. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And Wally, Wally Lewis was yet to come onto the scene. No. So they hadn't really kind of grabbed rugby league by the horns the way they would in the 80s. But essentially that's half the reason his image and then the other half is he kind of gains the loyalty of the police because the police have all these increased powers and this is then the beginning of the police being extremely corrupt in queensland and this is kind of where we can trace the beginnings of that there's always been corruption in both new south wales and queensland police but they kind of get really empowered after the spring box game because bjorki peterson has basically given them the green light to do whatever they want so there was a case where a hippie commune was burned down in North Queensland and basically the, the police burned them down because they suspected that they were growing cannabis there. They weren't. They were just hippies. They probably, I assume they were taking it, but they weren't growing it there. And so kind of media reports went to Bjorki Peterson and said, you know, shouldn't we have a commission into this? This is literally police going friendly Geordies on <laughs> this. <laughs> well, sorry going whoever did it to friendly geordies uh to this hippie commune shouldn't there be an investigation into this at least to look at misconduct and bjorki peterson said (laughs) no this is some leftist attempt to try and legalize marijuana i'm not going to have that wokeness (laughs) he didn't use the word wokeness obviously i'm not going to have that wokeness enter my state and so he refused to even follow up on a commission to investigate the police because according to him it was an attempt to legalize marijuana well, what it actually was, it was an alliance between Bjorki Peterson and the police where they kind of served each other's ends. So the police would kind of be the almost mil- private militia of Bjorki Peterson. They would go and suppress rallies quite often. There was much less protesting rights in actuality in Queensland than there were in New South Wales and South Australia and Victoria. And this was the beginning of an alliance that would actually ruin Queensland in the 1980s. And they are still recovering from today. And its system is still having to adapt to the corruption that could could enter Queensland because of that unholy alliance. I will add this as well. Bjorki Peterson had a fair few conflicts of interest that raised some eyebrows. (laughs) So he owned shares in oil companies and then his government would decide if those oil companies got permits to drill in, say, the Great Barrier Reef or not. Yeah, it doesn't really get... More insider trading than that. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, when asked about it, Bjorki Peterson would often y- use this phrase. Oh, you don't need to worry about that. Nothing. Don't need to worry <laughs> well, about Well, you're right. It. Well, <laughs> you heard the man. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to see here. And so. That's right. None of their business, really. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, so he kind of, after a lot of pressure, he kind of sold a lot of his shares. And then his wife, Florence, just bought shares in the same <laughs> companies. Just. And. Frequently drilled. Uh, so mm. she 
basically owned shares in mining companies. And again, the Bjorki Pedersen government were responsible for giving huge mining leases in Queensland for for, for minerals. And so Florence Bjorki Pedersen. Wow. Flobo. Flo- Flo- <laughs> <laughs> she only died like five years ago. She's huh? yeah. Crazy. So, Life well lived, funded by her affluent. insider trading. Well, perhaps. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> Sorry, not not throwing around any. You don't need to worry about that, Ben. <laughs> oh, you're right. Sorry, I was beginning to worry about it, but no, no need. <laughs> so yeah, the the corruption was pretty rampant, and his cabinet was filled with the same thing. So all his cabinet members, and we're going to see the extent to which corruption reached his cabinet in the 80s, but in the 70s, there were just huge conflicts of interest that really should disqualify you from like if you can't be a dual citizen because that might compromise your commitment to your country, then really owning shares in companies that you deal with frequently is a far bigger conflict of interest for my liking. It's not even a conflict. It's just a crime. It's inside (laughs) trade, yeah. (laughs) So my brother who works for the ASX is, I always try and hit him up about shares and he's airtight. He's like, I can't give you anything because he works for, he does security and he he looks at insider trading. That's his job. Mm -hmm. And he became the very thing you swore to destroy. (laughs) The premier's wife. They're very is, strict about that, aren't they? Well, about yeah, your brother trade. can't trade yeah. on the ASX, can he? Oh, surely not. Yeah, I think I remember chatting with him about it and he said he can't. But oh, like, as in my brother? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, so no, he, he has can't. to trade yes. overseas. Yes, um, exactly. So he does, yeah. does all this American trading instead. But like, who would know if you were told, I guess? So. And oh, like, could have gone. Yeah, I see, I see. To be honest, your the tax. thing about insider trading that often goes unsaid is you've got to read it, reach a certain cap before they start actually... Mm. following you up so yeah, I, I, I know another guy who works with my brother mm. and he was saying that he found i know the familiar link's going to be a bit long here but he found his girlfriend's sister's boyfriend's dad if you follow my link there mm. so girlfriend's sister's boyfriend's dad inside of trading on the stock market and like basically it was like yeah we've got him red-handed here but they're not at the threshold that we're going to go after him yeah, and so, so family you, dinner well you just stay up yeah. he was at the family dinner with yeah. the insider trader and he was like I could have you in cuffs pretty much yeah, right now wow. if we wanted to. Yeah, that is power. Might have been a little <laughs> little tense around the uh, around the ravioli there. <laughs> <laughs> so the 70s was pretty bad. The 80s, it gets significantly worse. The Senate is in crisis. Joe B. O.K. Peterson has left for federal office and now Senator Amadala. Sorry, sir. I'm going to have to interrupt you there. The Fitzgerald inquiry is investigating us and now I am no longer at liberty to comment on the situation. But you don't need to worry about that. Stuff you, Padme. I want to learn about the downfall of Joe. And also about PY packing 2008 Canberra Raiders William Zillman on the Patreon exclusive. 